I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Sono New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus LeBron. This month, we're in Long Island City. The anticipated and then canceled arrival of Amazon thrust the neighborhood into the headlines recently. However, the area's been on the verge for the last 30 plus years. It was a major rezoning under Mayor Michael Bloomberg that catapulted the residential development boom that's dramatically changing this region. Back in the 1800s, LIC was the playground for the wealthy seeking refuge from congested Manhattan. Then came the Long Island Railroad, and so began the waterfront community's metamorphosis from industrial hub to a new development frontier. On this edition, the last bastion, Queensbridge houses and how public housing is keeping color in the city. Price adjustment. Once an affordable alternative to Manhattan, Long Island City is now too expensive for some of its recent commercial tenants. And industry, innovation, and illumination. What's a lighting company got to do with the area's art scene? Those stories and more coming up as we explore Long Island City. Queensbridge, the city's and perhaps the country's largest public housing project, is located here in Long Island City. The development has become a symbol of the local and federal government's neglect of public housing. Now it's symbolic of something else. Some experts say Queensbridge and other housing developments are largely responsible for maintaining the diverse complexion of New York, as many areas of the city are becoming wealthier and whiter. Gary Pierre Pierre has the details. I hope you're all right. I'm gonna Andrew Johnson, a Queensbridge resident, has been selling books on the street for nearly 15 years. He's known as the bookman to many. He's kind of the unofficial mayor of this hub, where a busy bus stop shares space with the 21st Street Queens Bridge Station. It's a great project. It has some of the diff same difficulties that other projects have. Well, it's a great neighborhood, a great neighborhood. When I first came back here in um, 2001, I was working with a friend of mine in demolition. So we went to almost every borough on a lot of different projects. And then I realized that um, Queens Bridge it's pretty well kept up as compared to other projects. But it's a neighborhood, believe it or not. Matter of fact, I tell people all, all the time here, I'm trying to put the neighbor back in hood, okay? <laughs> the neighborhood is the subject of this documentary, Voices of Queens Bridge. It was produced by LaGuardia Community College students. The film highlights, in part, residents' pride as they try to keep the project a decent and dignified place despite decades of underfunding and neglect. Queens Bridge is home. It's first and foremost, you know, regardless of the title of being a president of the Tenant Association, Resident Association, I'm a resident first. This is home to me. That was the greatest gift that God gave me is the support that I had here. I had support like nobody else had. It's so much positive of Queen's Bridge. I just don't think 95% of the people understand what love is and what, what Queen's Bridge is about. The housing complex in Queens is the largest in New York City with more than 7,000 residents, many of whom are black and Latino and live below the poverty line. The complex is made of 26 aging buildings and is large enough to have its own library branch, stores, and supermarkets within its borders. Public housing like Queensbridge is increasingly what's keeping the city from becoming largely rich and white. That's according to people like Victor Bach. Bach is a senior housing policy analyst at the Anti-Poverty Group Community Service Society of New York. He says that since its origins in 1937, public housing always went into some of the poorest neighborhoods. Lower East Side at the time, in the 1930s and later, was one of those neighborhoods. And uh, if you look at the Lower East Side now, it's a very, very different picture. So you had public housing developed there, and the neighborhood had gentrified around it in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on. So. Uh, Right now, those public housing developments provide the Lower East Side with, uh, with uh, their uh, income diversity, 
and their racial and ethnic uh, diversity. Andrew Beveridge, a Queens College sociologist and demographer who has studied public housing for decades, says that public housing is also keeping the city's workforce affordable for business owners. I mean, the only people that would live here would be, uh, you know, would be quite affluent. I mean, I think one of the problems is, is you know, there's certain kinds of jobs, as, you know, like protective services, guard jobs, personal service, all that kind of stuff that doesn't pay that well. And so we wouldn't have any of that in New York. They, they might have those filled by uh, undocumented or documented immigrants. The numbers support that view. For instance, 22,000 of Chelsea's 77,000 residents are Asian, Black, and Latino. Most of them live in the area's public housing. In the Lower East Side, public housing dwellers account for roughly one-third of residents. Even in Harlem, known as the Mecca of Black culture, the 25 NYCHA developments are credited with keeping the community's 256,000 residents 46% black. From the beginning, public housing was built to address chronic inequality across the city, but now it is fighting for survival. This is not a stable situation. It's very much in flux. Uh, public housing is about to uh, receive a, a hot appointed monitor to oversee uh, its operations. Uh, it has a serious uh, capital backlog of uh, 32 billion dollars uh, required over the next 15, 20 years to uh, fix its infrastructure. Right now it's, uh, I think, fighting for its life. This is not the first time public housing has been under attack. Beveridge says there were attempts to privatize public housing as a backdoor to changing the city's racial demographics. The interesting thing, during the Reagan administration, you know where Lincoln Center is? Sure. Behind Lincoln Center there's a lot of public housing. And Reagan tried to knock it down, build fancy, fancy stuff, and uh, it got blocked. Still. Change may be coming to complexes like Queensbridge as increasing city rents drive more whites further into the other boroughs. The bookman can attest to the change. Uh, it's a little bit more diverse than when I first came here, which is a good thing. And I like that. More Asians here, more whites, more everybody. You know, like I said, I'm from Mississippi, but I've you know, been here since 72. And uh, that's what I love about New York City. The favorite city I've ever been to is this diversity. And that's what attracts me to New York City. And that's what attracts me to uh, QB also. For Diverse City, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Even as Long Island City continues to change, some things are staying the same. Manufacturing has a long history in the neighborhood. Brooks Brothers makes its ties here. The world's largest fortune cookie maker, Wonton Foods, turns out 4.5 million fortune cookies every day from their local location. Our Andrew Falzone caught up with two Long Island City-based business owners to talk about how the changes are affecting them. Roger Sadowski has been making guitars since the early 1970s. Then in 2011, he moved his operation from Dumbo to Long Island City. Now with his lease renewal coming up, Sadowski knows his days in Long Island City are dwindling. I know now that I won't be able to afford the renewal on this lease in a year and a half. So that's the story of New York, and uh, at least it's my story of New York, but I'm not alone. I've been bemoaning the loss of mom and pop businesses in New York since 1979 when I started my shop here. It breaks my heart every day. The story is somewhat different downstairs at Parsons Mirror's costume shop where owner Sally Ann Parsons thinks she'll be able to stick around after her renewal. Our lease is actually coming up for renewal and we will be faced with paying more to, the, to this landlord. Maybe a little bit too soon to predict, but do you know if you'll be able to stick around or not yet? I think probably, yes. Rent isn't the only issue plaguing these business owners. Parsons' previous shop was in Manhattan, close to many of her Broadway clients, many of whom thought Long Island City might as well be a foreign country. When we first moved here, I thought, nobody's going to come. I'm going to move, and there's going to be no work. We have been so busy since we moved here. 
and actually more profitably busy because of our rent being affordable. While Long Island City is still more affordable than Manhattan, it's not the bargain it used to be. Michael Stoller hosts the Stoller Report here on CUNY TV. We caught up with him and Long Island City real estate expert Eric Benaim to talk about rising prices in the neighborhood and other areas handling the LIC overflow. Companies who went to Long Island City for their office space, they went there and they went at $18 a foot, $20 a foot. Today, <clears throat> that industrial space, which was converted to office, the landlord wants $30, $35. Part of it's not greed because part of it is somebody bought the building at a higher price with the expectation that they're going to be able to get $30 or $40. So you have an opportunity to get in on early at a really affordable price um, for light manufacturing or manufacturing in Maspeth. Then you also have an opportunities in Astoria. There's some opportunities in Sun Sunnyside and Woodside. Sadowski says he's also concerned about the city's rising cost of living and how it makes hiring difficult. I've seen New York uh, chew up and spit out people in less than a year. To hire someone, have them relocate, without them absolutely knowing New York is where they want to be and deal with all the issues of living in New York, that, that can be a problem as well. Sadowski's guitars are on the higher end of the price range with a typical model costing about $5,000. They're geared more toward experienced players, music legends like Paul Simon, Bruce Springsteen, Keith Richards, and Jason Neustadt of Metallica all use Sadowski's guitars. Aside from the actual cost of relocation, it seems that his actual move won't affect his business or his clientele. Today, only 10% of my business is local. At this point, I'm so established that we actually ship 90% of the instruments we make out of the area. So I'm not concerned about that. Parsons Broadway clientele includes Hamilton, Phantom of the Opera, and The Lion King. Since so much of her business is tied to Manhattan's theater scene, the key is to strike a balance between accessibility and affordability. And she expects that some of her competitors, who still have Manhattan locations, may soon become her neighbors. I think that more and more, as their leases come up, they will be moving out here or to some place that else or further west in Manhattan. I'm Andrew Falzone for Diversity on CUNY TV. A snapshot of Long Island City today captures a neighborhood with a unique mix of factories, art galleries and artist studios. But that unique character seems to be rapidly slipping away. One factory has worked out a symbiotic relationship with artists that offers them some support. Judith Escalona tells us more. Long Island City's mix of commercial and residential spaces has been attracting artists to the neighborhood since the 1960s. The late sculptor Isamu Noguchi lived and worked here. He was attracted to the area because of his interest in industrial design. His personal gallery is now the Noguchi Museum. Then there's the Socrates Sculpture Park, an accessible art space that supports artists creating public works. There's also MoMA PS1, an arm of the Museum of Modern Art showcasing works of national and international artists. Just as important for the community are the local artists who are nurtured and showcased in smaller galleries. Bernard Kalvikis is one of those artists. He's lived in Long Island City since 2010. As a sculptor working in metal, Kalvikis requires a large industrial space like those found in Long Island City. I need to be able to weld, grind. It's, you, you make a mess, there's a fire hazard. It's, so there are certain studio buildings that won't let you in, period. When I searched for a space, I had to look for an industrial space and luckily this I was able to use, get a studio there. Besides needing a large studio to create, Clavicus also needs exhibition spaces that can hold his large sculptures. Much of his work is often shown outdoors. Recently, the sculptor created smaller works in response to an artist's call from the Edison Price Lighting Gallery. 
Artists were required to use scrap metals from their factory. And this was the residue. The, these were the leftover pieces they didn't need anymore. So you did a I, really nice job with it. Oh, and it's yeah. sort of open in the back. They're not. It's yeah, that's the open. other thing I'm obsessed with. I, I like to show the inside of something. I certainly offer the factory materials, and I offer them to every artist that reaches out. They don't have to participate in the show if they want to take the materials and run, and plenty of them have, and I'm all the more grateful that they've been part of it. The gallery sits above the Edison Price Lighting Company factory. Edison Price has been designing and manufacturing high-end lighting for companies and museums, such as the Museum of Modern Art and the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Museum. Nora Vizzini is the company's program manager. So it was founded by my grandfather in 1952, and he started the company in New York and had a factory on the east side of Manhattan for 40 plus years. And then eventually my mother and father moved the company to Long Island City in 2001. That move to avoid the growing congestion on Manhattan's east side positioned the gallery to be a significant space for Long Island City's artist community. In addition to providing materials and exhibition space, the gallery hosts talks and artist presentations. I think the art scene in Long Island City is well bonded. It has been a uh, um, artistic community for decades now. It is a strong knit community where most people know each other, most people are very supportive of each other. Despite his past good fortune, Clavicus has had to move twice in Long Island City in order to find sufficient space. Now he's been priced out. Long Island City has been changing though. There are a lot of, or there were a lot of small industrial buildings and those are being knocked down and high rises are popping up and you know, right across the street it happened, it's happening more. The building I had a studio in years ago, it's still there uh, for now, um, though I, I've heard there have been offers made on it, and it's, it, 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 we're losing space. Clavicus's work is being exhibited at a show called Revision. It features the work of 11 artists who were invited to use the factory's raw materials to create a new and unique perspective from the seemingly ordinary. The exhibition runs until the end of November. Judith Escalona, Diversity. Many of the buildings that scrape the sky in this neighborhood have long and sometimes colorful pasts. I met up with LaGuardia Community College historian, Stephen Petrus, who walked me through some of those stories. So Stephen, several buildings in Long Island City have histories that date back like a hundred years. Mm -hmm. One of them being a nearby building. It was yes. an old bakery. Let, let's talk a little bit about the history of that building. It has a fascinating history. Currently, the LaGuardia Community College C building, but it was originally the Luce Wiles Sunshine Biscuit Bakery building. It was completed in 1914, uh, the, called the Thousand Window Bakery, because the founders of this uh, company, they wanted to bring sunshine into their building. It was conceived of in, in the early part of the century to kind of be a competitor to Nabisco. They produced Hydrox cookies, crispy saltines, wow. uh, animal crackers there. They sold these items in tins, which have since become collector's items, really like people sell them on eBay. Uh, really tremendous history. They were here from 1914 to 1965. Now I know with the thousand windows, and you mentioned the fact that it was supposed to bring light into the, the bakery and so forth. That was kind of like a technological marvel at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was to design a factory in this way. Uh, it was good for the workers too to have like natural sunlight. I think it added energy into the, the factory floors. That was really their emblem. It became Sunshine Biscuits. 
they ultimately registered that name officially in the 1940s. And it had been a little bit of a problem too because other companies were using the word sunshine and they didn't have it officially registered. They were just the Loose Wiles company up until then, but they officially registered the name in 1946. Uh, and they had the, uh, this fantastic sign on the building, Sunshine Biscuits. So passers-by would see it, would be impressed by it. Um, it really stood out in this neck of the woods in Long Island City. So building pretty much down the block, another historical building, the Chiclet Factory. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about that building itself. The Chiclets Factories from 1920 sold chewing gum. The company itself was founded in 1899 by Thomas Adams. It became remarkably successful. The product sold for a penny at the time. And even during the Great Depression, they did well. Their capital was listed at about $5 million. Wow. Chewing gum in the Great Depression was fairly common, just like eating ice cream. People, Americans, even during hard times, would want something sweet, enjoyable. The American Chiclets Factory did quite well. They produced, of course, chiclets, dentine, and those were their two prominent items. And then in 1962, they came up with Trident gum. And again, just like the Sunshine Biscuits factory, they had the dentine chiclet sign in front of this building. So those two buildings really have a very deep history now, but now they've become you know, part of LaGuardia Community College. So what are they now? The first, the, uh, the bakery. Yeah. Yeah, the, they uh, closed in 1965. Uh, they were purchased by the American Tobacco Company eventually by Keebler and then Kellogg Company in 2000. Now it's become part of LaGuardia Community College. It's just called the C Building on campus, classrooms in the building, faculty offices, student service offices in the building. Okay, and the Chiclet Factory? The Chiclets Factory, it's part of the New York City Design and Construction Office. So a city agency is, is based here and they, they construct schools, public schools in New York City, libraries, museums, police precincts, wheelchair, accessible pedestrian ramps, based here in the old Chiclets Factory. The Chiclets Factory closed in 1981. And it was really interesting too, just the, the workers at the Chiclets Factory, they felt a real sense of loyalty. Um, some described it as a family atmosphere. Husbands, wives work there, sometimes even children work there. And also very interesting about the Chiclets Factory was the smell. There was this pungent, sinus clearing smell of cinnamon, sugar, and peppermint. Right. So imagine working in that environment and the workers felt a sense of attachment to it. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing this wonderful history that you did with us today. Well, thank you, Zyphus, for having me on and to talk about the fascinating history of Long Island City. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, you should show me around a little bit so I can see a little bit more of this great neighborhood. Yeah, I'd love to. Let's go this way. All right. Finally, there's a courthouse here in Long Island City that was built in the 19th century, burnt down, and then was rebuilt at the dawn of the 20th century. It's been a witness to history ever since. Tina Beth Pina reports. This courthouse has been the crown jewel of Long Island City for more than a century. It's the centerpiece of Court Square, an area that's nestled at the intersection of Thompson and Jackson Avenues. It was once dominated by industrial warehouses, but they're now being replaced by residential towers. This courthouse is very much connected to the history of Long Island City. Now a branch of the state Supreme Court system, the building played host to a number of notable, even notorious criminal trials. The first came in 1927, when Queen's housewife Ruth Snyder and her lover Judd Gray faced murder charges in connection with the death of Snyder's husband. Uh, the Ruth Snyder put the courthouse on the map. The media swarmed the little courthouse. The sordid details of the case became fodder for the tabloids and a horde of scoop-hungry photographers. Snyder and Gray were convicted of first-degree murder by an all-male jury, and in early 1928, each would sit in the electric chair. Ruth Snyder was the eighth woman executed in New York State, her moment of death captured by a reporter's hidden camera. 
Decades later, the courthouse would once again be front and center in the news with the 1952 trial of debonair bank robber Willie Sutton. He was known uh, for costumes, he, uh, disguising himself, impersonating people. Willie the actor Sutton was a career criminal who during a 40-year crime spree stole an estimated $2 million from various banks. He would spend much of his adult life behind bars. Willie Sutton is, is uh, said to have responded to the question, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he just looked at the person and said, because that's where the money is. Sutton was released for health reasons in 1969 and faded into obscurity, but the little courthouse of Long Island City still stands tall. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Diversity. Thanks for coming along on our walk through Long Island City, Queens. Join us next time when we'll hop across the East River to Loisada, the part of Manhattan's Lower East Side that gets its nickname from the area's once booming Puerto Rican population. Till then, walk around and enjoy our diverse city. <laughs>